service, so I'm going to make you do it too. Can we please welcome everyone here online? Thank you guys for joining us. Yeah, we're going to have to explain that one next week to them. They're going to be like, why on earth did you make us do that? This week, I want to start off this standalone sermon, this one-off sermon, before we get into a sermon on uh, biblical foundations. I want to start off by giving a little bit of an illustration, a little bit of a metaphor. There's a festival that occurs every year in India called Holi, H-O-L-I, Holi, also known as the Indian Festival of Colors. It is most famous for these beautiful plumes of powder, of colored powder that they'll throw into the air, they'll throw at other people as a reminder that this is a celebration of new life and of the color, of the vibrancy that spring brings. The festival has been copied by a couple different things, music festivals, different city and community activities, but the most famous of them is the Color Me Rad 5K runs that raise awareness for people with intellectual and social disabilities. But the festival itself, the original festival, the festival of Holy, I think has two beautiful parallels to the church. The first is that they are both a celebration of new life. When the church gathers, we are celebrating the new life that can be found in Christ. That the the old has passed, the new has come. That the winter has ended, the cold has gone away. And that warmth has come, that life has come. The second is that holy is a celebration of color. A celebration of difference. A celebration of variation. And the church, when it is at its healthiest is a celebration of difference, a celebration of hues, a celebration of color. In fact, I believe that the church is a celebration, in many ways, of the differences in our lives as much as the things that unite us. And if you don't believe me, if you don't believe me that the the church is a united body of very different people, well, I made you a map if I can get it to work. (laughs) Beautiful. I'll talk you through it anyway. In North America, there is a very well-known evangelist by the name of Billy Graham. Hey, there it is. Thanks, tech team. You guys are the best. There's a very well-known evangelist by the name of Billy Graham who died just a number of years ago. And Billy Graham held evangelistic crusades all across North America, bringing hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of people to faith in Jesus Christ. If you work your way just south from there, you'll run into a name that maybe you aren't the most familiar with, but you probably know the individual, even if you don't know his birth name. His birth name was Jorge Mario Bergoglio, the name you probably know him by is Pope Francis. He established a bit of a reputation for himself as someone who likes to shake things up, but some of the movements, some of the statements, some of the things that he has done as Pope has brought the Roman Catholic Church closer to the Protestant brothers and sisters than it has been in generations. You go uh, northeast a ways, and you'll run into a name that many of you know, C.S. Lewis, who has a beautiful talent, or had a beautiful talent, that I, frankly, am pretty jealous of. That you could take these super complicated theological ideas that are just way up here that you need like four PhDs and you still don't understand. And he could just boil them down into language that even a child understood. He wrote the Chronicles of Narnia, which is probably what he's most famous for. But there's two other works I think that every Christian should read that C.S. Lewis wrote. The first is the Screw Tape Letters and the second is Mere Christianity. And in both of those, he shows his ability to take these complicated theological ideas, boil them down into something simple, and make a beautiful story out of it. Just east, you'll run into another name that most of you probably know the individual. You just don't know them by this name. His birth name was Carol Woltiva. His name that you probably know him as is Pope John Paul II. After being born in occupied Poland, he grew up under first the Nazi regime and later the USSR. Once he became pope, he pushed, using all the influence that he had, to force the USSR out of Eastern Europe, and in the process, likely saved thousands upon thousands of people from false imprisonment and thousands upon thousands of people from death. 
and he did so in the name of Christ. Just south, you run into Apollos of Alexandria, the only ancient name on the list, an individual that is known as a church planter, as a preacher, and as a leader in the early church movement. South of him, there's Desmond Tutu, a name that some of you might know, someone who had a very heavy hand in the name of Christ in getting rid of the apartheid in South Africa. In India, there's Ravi Zacharias, an individual who died just a few years ago and was a Christian apologist, someone who took arguments from science and led believers, or led non-believers usually, to understand that science does not contradict the Bible or disprove God, but rather proves the likelihood of God and proves the Bible to be true. And then just southeast of him, you'll run into uh, Brian and Bobby Houston, whose names you probably don't know, but I guarantee you, you know the organization that they work in, Hillsong a large Australian church that has spread all across the globe and has caused churches the world over to reconsider the way that they view worship and its role in the Sunday gathering. All of these people have made massive changes in the name of Christ. And all of them come from radically different cultural and ethnic backgrounds. The church is, for all intents and purposes, a global movement. Christianity is a global movement, but more than that, I think it's something a little bit tighter. I think it's something a little bit closer than just a nonprofit organization, than just a building or a social club. I think that Christianity is a global family. And if you don't believe me, here's my proof. Galatians 3, 7 reads, Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. And that phrase, children of Abraham, it's actually a phrase that Jews would have used a lot. It's a phrase that refers to the status of the nation of Israel as God's chosen people and as one big family. Think of it this way. I know three individuals. Their names are Brandy, Robert, and Richard. They're all a little bit older than me. And the strange thing about the four of us as a group is that we have the same mom and the same dad. Which means if we we have the same mom and the same dad, we are family. We're family. We're brothers and sisters. We're siblings. We are family. In the same way, you and I, well, we have a common ancestor. We are all spiritual descendants of Abraham, which means we are family. And the family is a unit that doesn't just coexist together. They don't just ex- exist around a, a common hobby, something they all enjoy together. No, family exists on a deeper level. Family exists because of a mutual love, a, a connection that cannot be broken. And the Bible teaches us that we are indeed a global family. Christianity is a global family. And if Christianity is a global family, I'm not just bringing up the issue for the sake of saying, yeah, that's so nice, isn't it? And sending us all home with warm and fuzzy feelings. Although I hope it does have that effect for you. I mention this because there is a specific situation going on in our country right now that I think this is very relevant to. Specifically something that I have alluded to multiple times from stage and also during the Wednesday devotionals we've been posting online. There have been riots and protests in the United States in the name of racial justice. And Christianity has been very divided over the issue. People who call themselves Christians have been very divided on both sides of this issue. But if Christianity is a global family, people from all different backgrounds, all different walks, all different cultural and ethnic experiences— And that should influence the way we view what's going on in the United States right now, right? So the question that we want to ask and hopefully answer today is how does the fact that we are a global family affect how we view the racial justice movements currently going on in the United States? How does that change the way we view? How does that change the way we think, the way that we talk about them? How does our status as a global family change the way that we view racial, inju- or racial justice movements in the United States right now? And to begin answering that question, I want to turn to one of the scarier books in the Bible, one of the books we tend to stay away from, the book of Revelation. 
Revelation, like Gary Johnson said just a couple weeks ago, is actually very simple if you just understand the context in which it was written, and you understand the Old Testament allusions that it's trying to make. If you understand the culture it was written to, and the Old Testament it's trying to reference, it's a very simple book. So I'm going to tell you, before we open up this passage, what to look for. I want you to look specifically for different ethnicities and different languages that show up in this specific passage, because it's going to be very important to how we interpret what's going on here. We'll be in Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. It says, after this I looked, and the I here is the Apostle John. He's having a vision. It says, after this I, John, looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count. From every nation, tribe, people, and language. Just in case you didn't get that part, I'm going to repeat it. From every nation, tribe, people, and language. Standing before the throne and before the the Lamb. The Lamb here is Jesus. Standing before Jesus. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands and cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Revelation gives us a picture here of what it will look like when Jesus returns. You see, this passage is what's referred to as a parousia passage, and that word parousia is just a really fancy word that we stole from another language and adopted into our Christian vocabulary that means when Jesus comes back. This is a when Jesus comes back passage, and it's not meant to be hyper-literal. We aren't meant to take every single detail and say that's exactly how things are going to be literally down to the detail. Like, we aren't going to all join the Jesus marching band and then just walk around following him all day. I don't think that's how things are going to go. But it's meant to give us an image, and the image that is being painted here is of a Roman triumph, of a victory march that they would perform after winning a major battle or winning a war. It's a picture of a Roman triumph. So Jesus takes the place of the general who is walking before his army, walking before his people, leading them in a victory celebration. But John adds a detail here. Jesus, through John, adds a detail here that he didn't have to mention. So I think if he mentioned it, it was probably important. He says that the people here don't all look the same. They don't all act the same. They don't all speak the same language. They are from every nation, every tribe, every people, and every language. It gives me a little bit of a picture that I'd like to share with you. It gives me a picture of somebody who's walking in this victory parade, and they're wearing Jordans, they're sagging their pants, they got a snapback cap on. Uh, right next to him is, is a guy that's wearing a toga, and he's got like a big gray beard. Maybe he has some scrolls tucked under his arm or something. Uh, right next to him, there, there's a guy that's wearing a, a turban. He's got a long beard too, it's a little bit better kept, a little bit more trimmed, you know, very well taken care of, looks pretty well put together. And then right next to him, there's a dude who just has athletic shorts and some sneakers on, looks like he just got finished playing basketball, like he is sweaty. And then right next to him is someone in a suit, and then right next to him, is, you get the idea, right? And then John listens. Because he doesn't just say, oh, well, they're from every nation, nation, tribe, and people. Sometimes you can look, and you can kind of tell, oh, well, this person might have been raised in this country because of the way they dress. Or this person might have been raised in this sort of culture because they don't have any concept of personal space. Or maybe their concept of personal space is stay like eight feet away from me at all times. Coronavirus or not, I don't want to get near you. And so maybe sometimes you can watch the way someone behaves or the way that they dress and kind of say, well, maybe you were raised in this country. Maybe you were raised in this area of the world. But he also says they are from every language which gives me an image of these people as they're walking along next to each other, and the first guy, maybe he's talking in English. He's just talking about, you know, where he grew up. Uh, Right next to him, the person right next to him, he's speaking in Greek. And the person next to him is is speaking a dialect uh, of Hindi. And the person uh, next to him is speaking Spanish, and the person next to him is speaking German. And as they speak, somehow, even though they're all speaking different languages, even though they're all unique, even though they're all different, they all understand one another. They're all carrying this conversation together. That's the picture that I get here. Each of these individuals is unique. They don't all look the same. They don't all act the same. They each have their own unique languages, their own unique cultural experiences that they have brought with them from their time on earth. 
but they are united over one thing. In that last verse there, it says, and they cried out in a loud voice. Not thousands of loud voices, not hundreds of thousands of hushed whispers. They didn't all pray in turn. They didn't each take a moment to themselves. No, they cried out in a loud voice, a singular loud voice. They spoke as one. And what did they say? They said, salvation belongs to our God. They spoke out in worship of God as one. So despite the fact that all these people are unique, all these people are different, all these people have experienced vastly different things on earth, despite that, they are united. They are unique, but they are united in worship and celebration of our God and King. Even the picture of the celebration we get is cultural. This image is an image of a Roman triumph. When we read they were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches, this is an image, this is a a word picture of what a Roman victory march would look like. I think if John were to rewrite this letter today, if Jesus were to re-inspire the book of Revelation, he were writing it to the United States, this verse might say something like, there are, par- there are party streamers hanging from the ceiling, there's a disco ball in the middle of the room, they all had party hats on, and they had those little noisemakers to go, It's cultural. He's explaining it to them in a way that makes sense to their culture, to their ethnicity, to their experience. This passage embraces the differences between cultures and says you are each unique, you are each separate, you are each different, but you are united over one thing, and that is your love of and obedience to the Lamb. We are a global family. We are also unique yet still united. But there's one more fact about our family that I think we need to learn before we draw any conclusions, and that is that our family is called to be empathetic. It is called to feel one another's pain. It is called to share in one another's triumphs. We find that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 26. The scripture reads, If one part of the body suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And if one part of the body is honored, all the parts are glad. Paul gives us a metaphor for the church here. He says the metaphor is kind of like the human body. He he says the church, the church is very similar to the human body. And here's how. Imagine you're going to work. You get out of your car, you aren't paying too much attention, you're texting with one hand, you're closing the door with the other, and as you close the door, you smash your hand in the door. Right? You don't look at your hand and go, why are you crying? What's, but you, you, st- you, stop, sw- you stop bleeding right now. I swear, I will turn this car around. You don't do that, I hope. If you do, you need to get psychiatric help. Seriously. You don't look at your hand and say, stop hurting, what's wrong with you? No, you, you kind of, cl- you grasp it, you, you clasp it close, you, you do the healing navel, where you like stick it in your belly button, and you, I don't know why we do this. Like our stomach is going to make everything better. I don't get it, but we all do it. You stick that in your, in your stomach and go, oh, 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 gosh, that hurts. Oh, you might say a few choice words. If you do, I'm not going to judge you. When your hand gets smashed in the car door, your entire body feels it. Your hand hurts, but your entire body feels it. On the other side of things, if someone walks up to you after church and goes, oh, man, you've been in the gym, right? Oh, look at, oh my gosh, wow, you've been putting in work. Then you don't sit there and go, oh my gosh, they just called me stupid. Because your brain doesn't get offended when someone compliments your muscles. No, if someone walks up to you and says, man, your biceps are getting big. Girl, look at them shoulders. If someone does that, then your brain goes, wow, I feel really good about myself. Because when one part of the body is complimented, the entire body is honored. In the same way, the church must share in one another's difficulties, share in one another's hurts, share in one another's pains, and also share in one another's glories and triumphs. The church, in this way, is very much like the human body. What have we learned so far? We've learned that we're a family. We got that from Galatians chapter 3. We've learned that we are unique and yet still united. 
We learned that from Revelation chapter 7. From 1 Corinthians 12, we learned that our family is empathetic, that we feel one another's pain, but we also share in one another's triumphs. So what does that mean when we ask the question, how does it affect the, our view of the racial justice movements currently going on in the United States? I think the simplest answer here is that it means we have to listen. It means we have to listen. Now, I want to make an acknowledgement here that I am standing on stage as a 20-something-year-old white man, and so I'm expressing mostly to other people who have similar life experiences to me that we tend to be bad at listening and we need to learn to listen. Some of you who are watching at home or who are here in the crowd, because you have grown up as part of an ethnic minority, you don't need me to tell you anything. Not on this subject. And if so, then man, God bless you. And if I miss something, then you let me know because I need to learn. I need to listen as well. But for those of you who have a similar background to me, that haven't really experienced many racial things in your life, that don't see uh, anyone's view of your race, of your culture as holding you back in, in any way, then man, it's time for us to sit down, to shut up, and to listen. And then once we're done listening, there's some minor changes that maybe we can make in our lives to improve our ability to empathize, to be a family, to be unique yet united with all of our brothers and sisters, regardless of their ethnic background. Here's a few ideas. Some of us have a tendency of making some off-color jokes that might be offensive to some of our brothers and sisters. And we kind of laugh it off and say, ah, oh, we're, just, we're just kidding, we're just joking, it's not a big deal. It's funny, come on. And maybe, maybe you even have some friends. They're a member of whatever group you target with those jokes that say, yeah, no, it's, it's kind of funny, it's good. That's great for now. But what happens when you bring in that neighbor, when you bring in that family member, or that friend of a friend into your circle, who maybe isn't so comfortable with that kind of humor? Maybe they feel a little bit singled out. Maybe they feel a little laughed at. Maybe they feel a little victimized when you make those sort of jokes. You think maybe as preparation for bringing that person into your life, for witnessing to them, for loving them, as preparation for that person, maybe now would be a good time to start cutting those jokes out of your repertoire. Some of us have certain terms, certain vocabulary that we use, even if we use them sparingly, that is highly insulting to certain groups of people. And this one's not just about race. There's a six-letter word that starts with R that has been used in the past to describe individuals with intellectual or with social disabilities. It is an unacceptable word, and Christians should not use it. But many of us grew up using this R word. And if that word, or if a similar word, if a similar slur, if a similar insulting term is in your vocabulary, then maybe to make room for these people, to show them the love of Christ, to show people that even if you are different than me, even if your ethnicity is different, even if your experience is different, even if your brain is wired differently than mine, I still love you, I still care for you, Jesus is still for you. Maybe to show people that, we cut those terms out of our vocabulary entirely. Maybe we realize that we're living in an echo chamber. When we get on Facebook, when we get on Instagram, we realize, wow, I really only follow people that look like me, talk like me, act like me, think like me. And maybe a good step would be to find strong Christian voices that, yeah, you're united in your love of the Lamb, but you know what? You don't look like each other. You don't think like each other. Your childhood was not similar to one another. Maybe you start following those people. For those of you who are listening who, like me, are white, one great voice you should follow is Albert Tate. He's an amazing preacher from Southern California. He preaches at Monrovia Church, Monrovia Fellowship. He is a black man, and he has amazing experience walking both in white evangelical circles and in black evangelical circles. So he can kind of walk both worlds. He can empathize with you. He can speak to you no matter your background. His name is Albert Tate. Follow him on social media. Hit up his sermons. He's better than I am, I promise. He's amazing. Follow him. You will learn from him. 
if you are not white and you find that you too are living in an echo chamber and you're like, well, maybe I need to listen to my white brothers and sisters a little bit. Maybe I need to see where they're coming from. There's a great voice that Chris Nagley has mentioned multiple times to many of you. His name is Andy Stanley. He's a white dude. He's a skinny little white dude that looks something like your dad. Like, no matter what your dad looks like, he kind of looks like your dad. It's weird. He's a skinny little white dude from Georgia, lives in Atlanta. Andy Stanley is his name. Follow him. He's a very thoughtful individual. You will learn a lot from him. We need to start living outside of our echo chambers because when we start listening to voices that don't sound like us, then we can understand where they're coming from, we can empathize with them, and we can love them better. So that's just three quick ideas. We need to cut certain jokes out of our repertoire, we need to cut certain words out of our vocabulary, and we need to start listening to people who do not think and act like we do, but are united with us in their love of Jesus. Christianity is a global family. How does that affect the way that we view race relations in the United States, the racial justice movements going on right now? And even beyond that, how does that change the way that we view gender? How does that change the way that we view the Me Too movement? How does that change the way that we view people with intellectual or with social disabilities? Well, I think it forces us to listen. Why? Because if we're a family, if we are empathetic, if we are unique but united, then we got to love our brothers and sisters. And love listens. Love listens listens. Can I pray for you? God, God, we come together today to learn more about you, to become more like you, to worship your name, and to learn to take better care of your children. So God, help us to have the courage and help us to have the self-sacrificial love necessary to hear people who are hurting to hear people that are crying out, saying that they have been victimized, they have been mistreated, and give us everything that is necessary to be like you, to reach out and to love those people, to change the way that we behave in a way that is loving, that is kind to others that are nothing like us. Because while we are all unique, we are all united in you. And God, we know that if we become more united, if we become closer, if we start to love people that don't look and act and think like us, that it's just going to be so good for your kingdom, and we want to grow your kingdom. We want to serve you. We want to love your children. So we pray these things for your sake, God, for the sake of your kingdom. Help us to be more like you. In Jesus' name, amen.